I hate, I despise your peace, and I take no delight in your solemn assemblies. Even though you offer me your burnt offerings and grain offerings, I will not accept them, and the peace offerings of your fed and peace I will not look upon. Take away from me the noise of your songs, to the melody of your harps, I will not listen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Perhaps it seems to you that the readings for this evening were a little schizophrenic. We heard the reading from Amos where it sounds like we are to beware of the day of the Lord, a day of darkness and not light, of judgment. Then we heard from St. Paul in his letter to the church at Thessalonica um, to look forward to the day of the Lord and to rejoice at its coming. For the Lord will cry with a, with a loud voice and the sound of the trumpet and the dead will rise. A day of the rejoicing. So which is it? Is it a day, a day to be feared or a day to rejoice in? And even to welcome and even to pray for as we do often at our meals come, Lord Jesus. Perhaps here it's important to remember that preaching is always contextual. It is the Word of God applied to a particular people, but also then a particular time and place. The sermons you hear here at St. John and Sherman Center are not going to be the same sermons you will even hear at the Congregation of Plymouth or at Adel or even at one of our other neighboring churches. Because the context is different, the people are different, the struggles are different. And of course, sometimes the pride and the boasting and even the idols are different too. So we hear a different sort of preaching to those who are under the reign of Jeroboam II, that's what Amos was preaching to, and St. Paul, who was writing a letter of preaching to the church of Thessalonica. Who's in the midst of a great turmoil and struggle? That's the difference between the styles of preaching. Both are speaking of the same events, the coming of the day of the Lord. But because of where the people are and what they believe, the sermon's not quite different. Maybe you've heard this maxim uh, that we preach uh, comfort to the afflicted, but affliction to the comfortable. Heard that before? We afflict the, the comfortable, but comfort the afflicted. Because in both cases, the fear, love, and trust of, of your heart is not in the Lord. If you're comfortable, it means that you, you believe that you can live apart from God's word and his gifts. And so you need the law preached to you to afflict your conscience, to remind you that your soul dependency is on Jesus and him alone. But if you're afflicted, there's a different sort of idol at work there in the heart, which is that you fear love and trust or pain or your suffering or the catastrophe that's happening around you, perhaps even in this world. There, that affliction is actually a false affliction, and you need to hear the word of the gospel to comfort that afflicted conscience. Paul's preaching to the afflicted to comfort them. Amos is preaching affliction to those who are comfortable. It's been a long and peaceful reign by Jeroboam. His years are 786 to 746 BC. Israel had been expanded. It's attained really the largest of its territory, even to this day. And its national prosperity will never again reach the level that it is. Military security, um, economic affluence, is characterized by the sage. And of course, the people believe that they have all this property and they have all this wealth and they have this time of peace because the Lord has shown special favor to them. Special favor meaning that they have deserved all this extravagance of wealth and prosperity and peace. That's the scene that the prophet Amos walks into sometime around 760 to 750 BC likely. He's from a, a small village in Judea called Tekoa. And 
of course, he was a shepherd. Not surprising there. And he's given this really difficult mission, one that people do not receive, is to come into the midst of people who are comfortable and to prick their conscience with God's holy law. Harsh words to a smooth season. And so, in really what is a brief book, he denounces Israel as well as Israel's neighbors, their reliance upon military might, the way that they do not deal with just, injustice in their social uh, matters, but also their immorality and their shallow piety, observing feasts and festivals, sacrifices, as the Lord commanded, to be sure, but not in faith. Here comes Amos with this forceful, uncompromising preaching. And of course, how do the people respond? Who are quite comfortable, who believe the Lord's favors upon them, that there's no way they can overcome preaching a harsh word to them. But of course, the religious authorities push back, fight back. Amos has a personal confrontation, records in chapter 7, with the priest Amaziah. He gets expelled from the royal sanctuary, which at this time is in Bethel, and commanded not to prophesy in the market. Probably would have down to Judah and then just broke down with the preaching that he had preached. So he preaches against Israel's neighbor, he preaches against Israel herself, and then he preaches of the coming doom, which are the chapters following what we heard today. Israel is indicted for the same reason that anyone who is comfortable in themselves is indicted. For sin, injustice, lack of love and charity, trusting in themselves and not in God. And so, Amos preached. We didn't hear the beginning of the sermon, but I thought it would be appropriate to share it, share it with you. This is how it starts. Hear this word which I take up over you in lamentation, O house of Israel. Fallen no more to rise is the virgin of Israel, forsaken on her land, with none to raise her up. For thus says the Lord God, the city that went forth a thousand shall have a hundred left, and that which went forth, or that which went forth a hundred shall have ten left to the house of Israel. It's a ninety percent attrition in the world. For thus says the Lord to the house of Israel, seek me and live, but do not seek Bethel, and do not enter into Gilgal. Cross over to Beersheba, for Gilgal shall surely go into exile, and Bethel shall come to naught. Instead, seek the Lord and live, lest he break out like fire in the house of Joseph, and it devour, with none to quench it for Bethel. O you who turn justice to wormwood, and cast down righteousness to the earth. He who made the Pleiades and, and Orion, and turns deep darkness into the morning, and darkens the day and into night, who calls for the waters of the sea and pours them out upon the surface of the earth. The Lord is his name, who makes destruction flash forth against the strong, so that destruction comes upon the fortress. So you hear, part we heard sounded pretty difficult, right? Pretty dark, with no light, uh, starts out just the same way. And you'll note that it was a lamentation against them. So now you might wonder, why so schizophrenic a view of the last day? Is it a day that we pray for? That we cry out, Maranatha, that is come for Jesus? Thus Paul would tell us to encourage the Lord to come and to look forward to that day when he will raise us from our graves for those who are dead and meet us in the air for all. Or is it a day more like what Amos is preaching to those comfortable that they should fear that day and repent and turn back to the Lord? Well, that's the key, isn't it? Because we have two groups of people in the, in the uh, gospel text for today. They were all virgins made white in the blood of the Lamb, forgiven of their sins by God's holy declaration. But the distinguishing factor, of course, is that one was prepared for the coming of the day of the Lord, and the other was not. And how is the preparation illustrated by Jesus? They both had oils, again provided to them by the bridegroom for the day. One had oil, the other did not. Probably there are many sermons on this, we have another one on Sunday in a few weeks. But uh, the distinction here is that both, while seemingly 
prepared, one group is unprepared for that day. So, to apply the two texts that we heard, one group is like those to whom Amos preached, who are quite comfortable in themselves, yes, in the gifts that the Lord has given them, but not actually trusting in the Lord, but just trusting in the benevolence of the Lord, all the gifts that He's given. Well, surely, they deserve to be welcomed into that private chamber, chamber with the other virgins. But no, there is something yet that is required. And this is why Paul can preach to those in Thessalonica, those of faith, those who trust in the Lord, who are terrified and afflicted and, and distraught at what's coming upon the world and in their own city. For them, Paul preaches the word of comfort, a word that instills in them the oil needed to preserve them in faith until the day of the coming of the Lord. So the Lord can't say, watch therefore, for you know neither the day nor the hour. And you can hear that word in two different ways, can't you? Then? Watch therefore for a day when the Lord comes with fear and terror, with fire and judgment, to destroy the wicked and the unbelieving. That's true. But also watch therefore, for you know neither the day or the hour when the Lord himself will come with a cry of command and a voice or the sound of the trumpet. And you and all the dead will be raised to life and mortality. What's the only thing needed? What's the only distinction factor here? Is one group heeds the preaching of the Lord in repentance for faith, who trusts in the Lord for every good and life, and especially for the ultimate good, forgiveness of sins, life, and salvation. And those who Yes, hear that word, even maybe live outwardly as Christians in acts of piety, offering, making their offerings, and singing the songs, and following the liturgy, and yet do not live in faith. That is, trusting in the righteousness and justice of Christ, which has forgiven them. So, there's your instruction for today. Seek ye the word of the Lord. Look forward to the day of the Lord. And if today you became comfortable, and now you've been afflicted, hear this, the Lord forgives you, like eternal is yours. Or, on the other hand, if you became afflicted, hear again the Lord. The Lord has forgiven you. Jesus is coming. He's coming soon. Look forward to that day. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen.